Good evening and welcome everyone to our June 12th Education Committee meeting. Um, as you might be aware of the agenda, um, it is quite full and we have quite a bit to cover. So without further ado, I will be turning this meeting over to our superintendent, Dr. Ficotes. Good evening, everyone. And good evening to our guests. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, great. Um, as Ms. Cook Henry has said, we do have a packed agenda. We have five items that we will highlight this evening, um, starting with um, our um, artificial intelligence. We have school improvement planning. We also have a lakeside, I mean, an update on um, Lakeside uh, that's support that we provide to students, a special education update, and then the action plan for our survey results that we um, recently received updates on. Uh, we're gonna get started with Dr. Agnew and the way that this will proceed is that after each section, uh, we will entertain questions at that time. All right, so Dr. Agnew, I'm gonna turn it over to you um, for the artificial intelligence update. Thank you. Um, so before we start, I just wanted to play a short video explaining what AI is so that everybody had a better idea of um, what we're talking about. You've probably heard a lot about AI recently, but what is it really? AI or artificial intelligence is when we teach computers how to do things that usually require human intelligence, like identifying an object, understanding human speech, and even talking. But how do you teach a computer to learn and think? Well, it's kind of like when you train a pet to do tricks. Think of AI as a robot dog that you're training to fetch a toy. At first, your robot dog might not even know what a dog toy is. So that's the first thing you need to teach it. You show it lots of pictures of dog toys so that it learns to recognize them quickly and easily. It might make some mistakes at first, but with each correct answer, it gets a reward. Over time, the dog's recognition improves the same way you improve at any task the more you do it. And once the robot dog gets really good at recognizing what a dog toy is, you can move on to teaching it the next step of playing fetch, running after the toy and bringing it back to you. This is basic AI, which learns by analyzing lots of data. In this case, pictures of dog toys and how to play fetch. But there's something even more complex called generative AI, which is more like a creative robot that can improvise when it comes to making art or writing. Unlike the robot dog, the creative robot learns from everything on the internet. Videos, text, photos, you name it. When you ask it a question or give a hint, it uses what it has learned from the internet to create new things, like answers, stories, or even pictures. But here's the catch. That creative robot can sometimes make mistakes, and it doesn't know the difference between good and bad. It doesn't know if what it creates is helpful or hurtful. It can't always tell facts from fiction or know where its information comes from. It might even use someone's work without crediting them. It just sucks up all the random or not so random information that's floating out there on the internet. That's why we, as humans, have to think hard and be critical about the information we receive from AI. We have to know what it does well and what it doesn't do well. As we use generative AI in our lives, remember that we have to be smart and responsible with how we use it. So that's just a brief overview of what AI is, and so it should give some um, uh, some um, concept to what it is. But what it is, it's in everybody's lives, um, if you realize it or not. And unlike a lot of things that you might see on the television or read about it, it's not alive. It's not smarter than us. It's not killer robots like the Terminator. It's not only for geniuses. It's not only for people that are very techy. Um, it's it's not inside of our computers, software, or phone apps. So um, the big thing you want to remember is that it's not going away, and that you actually probably use it a lot every day. Um, whenever you're checking out at a store, or if you're using uh, Siri or anything like that. 
And in education, it can really help us. And this is what our AI working group that the district set up is really examining. Um, so it can personalize learning. It can, uh, so if a student is struggling with a certain concept, it can create practice problems that would help the students um, with the concept that they Mary, I don't hear you anymore. Oh, can you hear me now? Mary, you're muted. Yes, you can. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yes. It can um, differentiate in seconds. It can increase student persistence because it's going to give them uh, problems that they can work on their level so that they will continue to keep working because they will face success. Um, it's text to speech, speech to text for students that may not speak our language. Um, but it's not going to replace teachers. It's not going to solve every single problem that we have. And it's not one more thing that a busy educator needs to do. And it's not another subject. It's going to be part of all subjects and it's going to be prevalent throughout everything that we do. So the district has set up an AI working group. You can see the members on the left. And we really picked a varied cross section of the district. We picked people from all different buildings, all different subjects and um, all different job types. And this is our AI timeline. Um, so we formed the group, we're having meetings and we are uh, we presented at the policy meeting, I'm presenting at the education meeting. We actually have another meeting tomorrow and we've set up PD for the upcoming school year. Does anybody have any questions? Dr. Agnew, are you recruiting additional members to the committee? How would staff members uh, join the committee if they were interested? So we will be recruiting additional members um, the beginning of the next school year. Right now, we've had a couple of members who are leaving the district, so we will replace those. But we want to keep it to around 20 so that it's more productive. And we'll be I'm replacing people with similar people, you know, similar jobs, similar people. And the only thing that I would add is that we did send out a an announcement for anyone in the entire district who wanted to be a part of this AI group. I think that was done maybe three months ago. And based upon those individuals who submitted their information, then we um, formed the actual committee. Ms. Um, Cook Henry, I think I see Ms. I see Mr. Tom okay. and, and Ms. Hoff. Ms. Hoff. Um, Mr. Tom. Thank you, everyone. Um, <clears throat> so I just have a couple questions. Uh, first off, um, do we have an age group that we're looking at particularly to introduce this with, or is this introduced to everyone? Um, is there a limit where we're not allowing certain um, students to engage with the AI, or are we opening it up to all? Um, you know, some of those kinds of questions um, are, are running around in my head, do we have somewhere where we're, you know, a, a level set, a threshold where we're trying to keep this um, a safe from, because there are a lot of things in AI that, you know, or, and do we have a platform that we're using for students and teachers? So, so that's what the working group is looking at right now. We're looking at um, Magic School AI and maybe Copilot because they contain the information so that the information is um, in a contained set. So that means if you put stuff in there, it doesn't go out to the, the wider world. It's contained within the district. Um, and the plan is to have pilots of the people who are teachers on the committee to pilot the program next uh, fall semester within their classrooms. And this would be um, grades eight and above uh, so that we're SIPA and COPA compliant. Um, but after that, we will look to expand it. We really want to see people on the committee and their reaction and what they like and do not like and really compare the two products um, because they're the two that we've narrowed it down to. And then that way we can really choose one or the other. And they're both very highly rated. Um, we've researched them. And, and this is uh, to help students learn or to help students um, complete work, or is this to help teachers teach? Um, 
how how do we see it being used? So all of the above, um, it'll help teachers teach. Um, we really want the teachers to work on lesson plans and projects with it. That's a big thing that we've been discussing, like how do you create projects and assignments in your classroom to work with AI? Um, and one of the big things that we've been discussing is it's more about the process with AI and grading the process, not so much the product. And so that's really going to be a shift for a lot of teachers um, to use AI in a productive way so that you are using it as part of the process. Um, and an easy way to explain that would be, for example, with math. When you have students complete math projects, you tell them to show their work. And the reason why is because they can get the correct answer, but you want to see the work to see how they got to the answer, which is what you're grading them on. And so you can actually use AI to help students do essays or um, do assignments, and you want them to use the AI, and you want to get a printout of how they, the prompts that they put in and how they use the AI or show their work and then, you know, use it that way. So it's really going to be um, yes and um, to your question that we want the teachers to use it, we want the students to use it, we want office staff to use it. Um, to help them um, as well, because it can really help them a lot with their uh, work duties. Thank you. Ms. Hoff. Um, thank you, Ms. Cook Henry. Um, fabulous stuff. I wondered if there were any citizens or upper class students, um, I'm sorry, high school students on the committee. Did we open it up? Uh, to citizens, not even necessarily yeah. parents. Yeah, we did not. Um, I think including, well, and that's why the students are going to be part of the pilot because we're going to gain feedback from them of what they think about it. And one thing that we have discussed is um, that it's really important that the community and parents understand how AI work. So I think it would be a great idea to include members of the community. Um, so we'll look into that um, to including people. Um, yeah. In and maybe we sent out a thing um, for people to volunteer for interviews. So maybe those folks, you know, might be interested or some of the budget advisory folks. Um, we have a lot of uh, IT sort of like folks in town, so. And board maybe. members. Yep. No, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> um. And Ms. Quick Henry, if you're speaking, I think you're muted, but we have- um, Ms. Brown? Yeah. Yes. Yes, thank you. Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. I just wanted to, to make a comment as I was listening to what you said about uh, AI, thank you for the information as far as what it can do and what it doesn't do. And I know I have so much more to learn about it. But I was just very curious when you mentioned that it can help students with their um, skills where they may need uh, extra support or enrichment where that may be needed. And I was curious as you've been using it already, um, you know, as you are learning about it yourself, what type of feedback does it give the student as they're going through that cycle of questions that you were talking about? So, for example, if a student's working on a thesis uh, statement uh -huh. or an essay, it might say um, you have a good start, except maybe you should include more information about this or have oh, you thought okay. of this? Or, for example, if a student's working on like a lab report and they're doing a hypothesis and they type in a hypothesis, um, mm -hmm. it could tell them, uh, remember, hypothesis need to be an if-then statement, and then it would help this it prompt the student to do an if-then statement so that it would be a a proper hypothesis. And so things and with, like that. And and that uh, sounds just quite interesting. And would it um, also give the students examples? Like if it's a hypothesis, would it give them examples of certain ones that are done? Uh, you know, just for them to see if this is that how it works possibly well, so yeah but it also works on how you prompt it so it's kind of like oh. what you ask it it will give you um but that's why you want to use things like Conamigo or 
um, co-pilot education or magic school AI because they will not give them the answer. They will prompt mm -hmm. them up to a certain point because they're made for education. Um, if a student yeah. went on to like a normal chat GPT or something, it, might, it would give them the whole answer. But if right. it's the one specifically designed for education, it'll prompt them. Oh, that's very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. If if I were IT inclined, I'd sign up, but I'll just have to keep listening to what you share. Thank you. Ms. Cook Henry, I do oh, I think Jan Jan, is your hand still up or was that from previously? Oh, oh this is a new question. <clears throat> so as we discuss um the various yeah. options that we're allowing um yes. uh AI, different tools that we're allowing. How do we prevent students from going home to use things like ChatGPT or Gemini and things like that, even though we have given them um, a, a tool to use, um, you know, students can go on and say, hey, create me a fake account with, you know, so that I can get in and do the homework this way. How do we prevent that from occurring? Because those are the and, things that I think teachers are are fearful of, and I think the parents are fearful of. Because mm -hmm. how does it circumvent the things that we've put in place to support them and to help them learn? But this is a way to get the answer to get to get to the end. And I think that's where the the creation of assignments comes in, because you're going to say show your show your work. And with um, for example, with Magic School, it you as the teacher have access to all the students' prompts, um, so you would. If you are actually like in like the math example is perfect because if you don't show your work, you lose points. So you can give me a perfect product, but if you're not showing me how you got to that product, you're going to lose points. And I think that that's really the mindset that a lot of people need to shift to that you aren't just grading the completed assignment that the student gives you that you want to see how they got to that final assignment because that way you can kind of guide them to not use um, a chat GPT. Um, and you can also, we're, we're telling them, this is a, something that can help you. This'll, this can help you with this. Um, so we want you to use it responsibly and not you know, get around it by using something else to get the answer, which is we're looking for the process, not the answer. Un understood. And I'm not trying mm -hmm. to make it a gotcha or anything like that, but yeah. I, I know that our, our students, you know, they're very sh sharp on, on lots of things and, you know, finding a way around some of the stuff is what they really excel at. But, you know, uh, why couldn't they prompt chat GBT or some other tool to say, hey, I want the answer plus how to get there and then get that result to give to you so that it'll go into the system with all of the pieces that you need. So my question is, again, how do we prevent that from happening? And I know we may not have the perfect answer. Yeah. I think, what, I think is, one, what is our work to try and to... I think, one of the, I think one of the things, Jan, is to structure projects such that there is time in the class for students to complete the work so that you are a part of the work completion process. And then for some assignments, especially for papers that are written, um, you can definitely run a the product through a system that will determine whether or not for you what what percentage of the project was generated by chat GPT. So there are some things that I know colleges are currently utilizing to assess this as well. Okay. Uh, and I think that, oh, I think one other thing to keep in mind is um, that that's why we're going to run the pilots so that we can kind of see all these things and teachers can see them so we can better prepare for when it does get fully launched. Okay, because, uh, you, you know, uh, some of the tools that you mentioned, um, will our staff have access to those tools to go on to like things like ChatGPT where they will be able to scan it to see if some other tool other than the ones we're using uh, help create that result or that. So, what, so right now we don't have um, any AI tools blocked for any teachers. And uh, we informed them of that in the beginning of the school year. Um, so, and there's uh, a lot of different scanners that you can use that are free. Um, we should probably look into getting a purchase one um, to do a more thorough job. 
But for example, in the cyber program, the program that we use, um, Edgenuity, it already scans for AI tools. So whenever students hand anything in, the teacher will automatically, it checks for plagiarism and for AI use. So the teachers get prompted to what that is. So there's similar products for non a ingenuity, right? There's there's similar products. So that's something we can start looking into. Thank you. Ms. Cook, I don't up. see any additional hands raised. Okay. I'm going to move us on to our next item. Thank you. Um, as most of us know, our uh, next item, we've provided this update typically annually. Um, and so in the state of Pennsylvania, um, there are standards that schools must meet and um, our state has modified their Every Student Succeeds Act. And as a result of those modifications, there are three categories that schools could fall into, CSI, ATSI, and TSI, with CSI being the area that um, schools or schools that need the most support. ATS, ATSI followed by them and then TSI schools. So in our district, we have two schools that fall into um, one of those categories each. And so tonight we're gonna start off with Penwood High School. Um, their designation is ATSI. And I believe Mr. Chicano is on and I will advance through the slides. And Mr. Chicano, you can take it from here, sir. Good evening, everybody. Thank you uh, for having me. Uh, excited to share this information uh, and hopefully I'll get to see all of you tomorrow at graduation. Um, so the ATSI is a three-year designation, comes with IU support and the state reviews for exit every three years and then a planning year. This is the second time we have been uh, given the uh, ATSI designation um, and it's 2018, 2022, and the next is gonna be 2026. Um, in order to implement um, our ATSI focus improvement plans with Fidelity, we meet monthly and continuously with our uh, school improvement facilitator from um, the DCIU, Ms. Sydney Tassone, as well as uh, William Penn uh, District leadership to help monitor uh, our progress and goals. Um, what's missing on that slide, we did pull um, student focus groups um, to get an idea of the temp their temperature to help us meet these goals. Um, which were very uh, informational in uh, determining our path forward. Um, here are the uh, areas of focus for our special uh, special education designation. Uh, it revolves around the ELA and math proficiency graduation rate, regular attendance rate, as well as the PVAS growth um, in, in, in unison with our um, NWEA map data. So these are the percentages we're looking to uh, achieve and get past. Um, and we do have an opportunity to exit. In order to do that, um, we have to reach each one of the goals. So there's a possibility we are we will hear from the state in October or September. I'm sorry, uh, if we met that based off of our um, Keystone exams, graduation rate, and our attendance rate from these uh, uh, the last few years. Um, to help achieve our goals, these are some of the initiatives we're looking to implement. Um, we're trying to work with a restorative practice model and PBIS, uh, enhancing our PBIS, um, our common planning time initiatives and professional development. We're looking to increase and improve that, especially for students with disabilities, um, looking to improve our co-teaching model uh, and support our staff in that. Um, and then we're looking at uh, supporting our case managers to better progress monitor and align their supports for our special ed students. And then we're looking to um, build a foundational program for our ELA, uh, 10th grade ELA courses to particularly target students who um, need specific areas of growth. Um, so we're pilot piloting that next year um, to, in, in hopes of achieving our ELA, um, our ELA ATSI goals. So some of the fun allocations we have, uh, you can read on here, um, many of it, lies under the uh, student focus and staff focus. You'll see here um, some of the things that we did for uh, the student was vector, which will help our graduation rates. Um, we also looked at some curricular resources. Um, we're looking for a restorative justice coordinator for next year. 
Um, so there's a lot of initiatives that are new for for like later this this current school year, but also for next year that we're really excited about um, to help achieve these goals uh, and exit the ATSI. That is uh, that concludes my part of the presentation. So are there, are there any? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Dr. Quick, <laughs> are there specific <laughs> questions for Mr. Chicano and the high school? Jennifer? Uh, thank you, Dr. B. Coates. Um, was the uh, mentorship program, I'm forgetting the name of it, a part of your uh, ATSI? The um, I see you. I think she's referencing the work with Mr. Potts. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay. The, yes. Um, so they helped us build uh, the community partnerships. Um, so one of the things you can see on here, like the parent engagement activities, guest speakers, uh, a lot of the connections we have made um, through the community uh, was through the Potts group. Um, the picture, Doc, if you could go back one slide to slide 17, that picture we have um, is actually the initiative for our uh, co-op co with Wa uh, Wawa. So Tennyson there is our first student of the month. Um, Tennyson uh, was in Wawa and a couple of his peers were making some poor choices. And so he intervened and the um, general manager recognized it, brought him over, reached out to me um, and we, we highlighted him. So he received lunch for a week um, and that's grown into our May designation. So we had, we have like a student a month, student uh, most improved student of the month, and a teacher of the month. Um, so a lot of these initiatives around the PBIS supports um, are through those, through that partnership with the POTS group. So yes, Ms. Hoppe, uh, that's definitely helping us uh, achieve these goals. But that relationship with the POTS group is over now. It ends at the end of this year. Um, there are some things that we they part of the contract. Um, lends itself into some August professional development when staff come back. Um, but yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Tong? I'm sorry if I missed it. Um, <clears throat> are we on track for um, exiting uh, this particular status? And I know you have shared that the state is looking at um, exit criterion, but how far do you feel we are close to exiting or are we not close to exiting? Great question. So I think for attendance and graduation rates, we're trending upwards. The um, proficiency is an up and down because it's it's so few kids. Um, it's really hard. And then COVID, the impact of COVID is still affecting affecting these numbers. Um, so my hope is that we meet it. The struggle will probably be reaching it in, in the proficiency rates in math and ELA. And Mr. Okay. Tong, there are some things that we are definitely looking to do um, differently around proficiency targets. Um, and so more information will be coming about that. And I'll be following up with the school. And, Ms. and Mr. Giacano, correct me if I'm wrong, the work that Mr. Potts was doing, um, was that beginning to lay a foundation and hopefully to build capacity so that some of that work could be owned by the school staff and leadership there? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, uh, folks, for that information. No problem. Ms. Cook Henry, I do not see any other hands, so I was going to move forward to the uh, middle school, if we could. Sounds good. All right. And we're going to ask Ms. Cox to please lead us in the discussion as it relates to CSI, and this is for Penwood Middle School. All right, thank you, Dr. B. Coates. Thank you, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Um, as you can see, this is just our slide for our steering committee, members of our cabinet who supported us as a CSI school, which means that we are the lowest tier, meaning that our scholars and our school needs the most comprehensive supports and continuous uh, growth for our students within our building. Um, so as you saw on that previous slide, Members of the DCIU, Heather uh, Saddlemeyer, uh, Sarah Christensen, as one of the coaches for the principal, supports Penwood Middle School to make sure that we're uh, working very diligently to support the growth that's necessary for our scholars. Areas of focus include um, our ELA proficiency, math proficiency, similar to the high school, 
and also our regular attendance. So one of our goals for the year moving forward 24-25 is to perform, perform at the 55th median growth percentile or better on the MAP benchmark, which is a benchmark that the scholars take, uh, um, they take that benchmark three times a year. So from fall to winter, the goal would be that the scholars perform 55% or better for ELA, 40th percentile for uh, the special education population. And for math, again, the 55th percentile median growth for our scholars for the math assessment. For regular attendance, we're hoping that our scholars who are at risk or not meeting regular attendance will improve by 15% for the 24-25 school year as well as improvement for our PVAS data in ELA, ELA and math. This is our, um, and there's hyperlinks in here, which I'm not gonna have us go through because they are lengthy, but this is our school improvement process, PDE. This is from the state. These are three, just three key essential practices that Penwood Middle School will be focusing on, particularly for the 24-25 school year. Um, and one of these things, one of the things that we did with our need assessments was looked at our problem of practice, looked at our areas, created priority statements, and then looked at what evidence-based strategies would we implement to support each essential practice to support um, overall student uh, individualized growth across, this, across all uh, reading, math, and science. So uh, again, you can see here from the slide, essential practice four, focusing in on identifying and addressing student learning needs. Five, essential practice, um, providing frequent, timely, systematic feedback and support around instructional practices. This really tears itself to teacher effectiveness. How effective are our teachers in supporting our scholars' growth? So that is, uh, there's a, a, a plethora of evidence-based strategy within our CSI plan that taps into each essential practice. Essential practice 12, implementing an evidence-based school-wide positive behavior intervention and supports team PBIS for the 24-25 school year. You will see in one of the slides forthcoming that one of the things that's budgeted for the 24-25 school year is to have the third assistant principal who will support the work for the PBIS implementation. These are some action steps for implementing our plan for 24-25. And you can see here, I'm going to just highlight some of those things, making sure that we continuously support our mathematics, particularly around problem solving and also interventions for reading um, through our tier one instru instruction. What does it look like every day in every classroom for scholars to receive tier one instruction? A lot of that lift is led and supported by our school-based teacher leader and also the academic uh, focus uh, assistant principal. We also have some steps around making sure that there is instructional coaching, particularly happening for our new teachers, as well as teachers who might need a little more push or what we call our yellow band of teachers. Common planning time will continue to happen for the 24-25 school year, um, collaboration with our partners for DCIU, vendors and community members um, throughout the school year. Um, and then of course, building level leadership. Uh, we will continue with our MTSS plan as that is a district-wide William Penn initiative to make sure that there's a multi-tiered system of support for all scholars across the school. This is a slide that is highlights our MAP data. Our MAP data is our uh, major benchmark that we use across William Penn as an indicator of scholar proficiency and percent growth, particularly what I mentioned earlier, that median growth percentile, how, how much are our scholars faring in their growth? And are they making enough growth from fall to spring? So this is our um, data from our most recent uh, score reports from our math assessment for reading and math. And as you can see, um, the reading results, 19% 19, 19 of our scholars uh, scored 60% within the median growth percentile and 20% scored uh, uh, 20 uh, within a 60th percent uh, growth median percentile, 20% for math. Um, our actual CSI goal for this year was that we had, which was a little aggressive, but that was the plan that was in place um, for from the summer, which was a 75% growth indicator from fall to spring. I think you skipped one, Dr. Vico. There we go. Thank you so much. This is our timeline to meet the exit criteria. There's some um, probably some fluidity here. Um, in the fall, the um, administrative team will meet to look at the timeline and also look at the goals 
for a final review. This result, this data is results from our 2022 results available from the state. So you can see um, here um, our math and ELO combined achievement, 17.8. Um, and you'll see our combined growth. Um, you can see there was a, dot, a dip there here for math and ELO combined growth for the school year of 22. And our ELA, English language proficiency, 4.3. So just to highlight our exit criteria, continuously maintain a sustainable improvement plan uh, for interim, which is our short-term goals and our long-term goals for the 24-25 school year. And what does that look like? That looks like really zeroing in on identified goals, aligning them with our school improvement plan quality rubric, which provided by the DCIU, that rubric will help provide further guidance around how we will be our identified goals. And then again, continuous monitoring and review and assessing the growth throughout the school year, bi-weekly meetings with CSI, monthly meetings with CSI, and of course, collaborative meetings that happen as a leadership team. So those quarterly views will also continuously happen to capture progress and um, track and monitor along the way, make adjustments if need be to support uh, continuous growth for our scholars with fidelity. This is our fun uh, slide. Um, we are still waiting for our final budgetary funds from Title I monies um, and CSI funds as well because we get a bucket of money from both. This slide shows us what we've received already from this year, and you can see the numbers here upwards of $326,000, um, $100,000, I should say, and um, indicative of what we don't know yet what the final figures will be for 2425. However, the goal for 2425 is to continue to have two site-based teacher leaders, um, which will support our essential practice of the MTSS process um, for our scholars um, and uh, our assistant principal add-on, which will make Penwood Middle School hopefully have three assistant principals to support where that third assistant principal will zero in on our uh, evidence-based strategies for PBIS. And that is the final slide. Any questions for Penwood Middle School regarding our CSI plan or status? Looks like Mr. Tong, your hand uh, is. You have, yes. So, um, Principal Cox, I'm I'm going to have a similar question for you as I did for Mr. Chicano. Um, in terms of exit exiting your current status, uh, how close do you think we are to exiting that status? And when you do exit that status, do you believe we're going to exit to the next level, which is less, or do you think we can get out? From what I know, I believe this is year six for Penwood Middle uh, for CSI. So um, there has been some growth from looking at the PSSA data from year 2020, 2018 through 2023, which is the most recent. There's been small growth, case in point, from um, years... There has been about, so for case in point from 20, I'm going back from 2022, and I, I might not have this in order, but it was 28% one year, 2022, 2020, then it was 28%, this is for reading, and then it was 52%, and then for math, 5%, 9%, 33%. So it's been inconsistent. I think COVID years definitely took some impact, but I think there's been inconsistency in Penwood Middle School in general, staffing inconsistency, leadership changes, all of those were contributing factors to me in regards to whether or not the Penwood Middle School will exit. I think there's some work to be done, uh, particularly one of the biggest areas uh, that I believe is of need is making sure that there's effective teaching happening in every classroom. And what does that look like? And then consistency with fidelity and accountability checks along the way to make sure that there's sufficient progress and sufficient supports in place, particularly to support our uh, Special education population, when we looked at our data for special education, I believe we're about 27%, and Kate can correct me if I'm wrong, with our special education population, which is a high needs uh, group, so our tier three, and making sure we really wrap around our MTSS process with fidelity. So I think there's some work to be done. I'm not sure if we will exit in the upcoming year because there's a change uh, for administration and there are changes with staffing, so I'm not sure. But again, like I mentioned earlier, I believe this is year six for Penwood as a identified CSI school. Thank you, Principal Cox. Thank you. Doesn't look like I see other questions. I will just share though that next week we are having 
leadership meetings um, and training and development all week with principals. And one of the areas that we will be discussing are goals and progress toward meeting goals. And so specific emphasis and additional supports will be provided for these two schools, especially as it relates to tracking of data um, and having real-time data to support our um, review of data in real time and how students are progressing. Uh, we've had some initial meetings with both of these schools, as well as some other schools on utilizing some, some data tools to help us from that perspective. So more information will be coming to the board on that as we continue to um, make sure that these schools are getting closer to exiting um, their current status. So I'm going to continue on and move us forward since I don't see any other questions. Is that okay, Ms. Henry? All right. I think you said yes, Ms. Henry. I couldn't hear you, but I will move us forward to um, Lakeside Neurological Services. This is our end of year review. Um, as most of you know, um, we have uh, received a lot of support with Lakeside. And uh, I believe Ms. Janine is here with us this evening. And so I'm going to um, turn it over to you and um, you can provide highlights. We have it listed by school site where Lakeside is providing us with support services. Thank you, Dr. Picoats. Uh Good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to say it's just been really um, a pleasure. Uh, this partnership with uh, the William Penn School District has really been uh, our, our pleasure. Um, and um, we, we really appreciate the opportunity. Um, as we look at Penwood Middle School, um, the uh, student support counselor there provided 337 uh, individual uh, counseling sessions uh, to uh, students. Um, student consultation and regulation support is 127. And that's a little different from the counseling. And so what that, um, an example of what that looks like is uh, Janine uh, is, has eloped from the classroom or Janine's walking up and down the hall. I won't say she's eloped from the classroom. Janine's walk, walking up and down the hall um, or is asked to leave because uh, she's having some challenges managing her emotions. So what we do is we, we meet with that student and we provide strategies. We first of all, work with them to find out what's happening. And then we uh, work with them to provide strategies to kind of help them regulate, help them calm down, um, process in with the goal of returning to classroom um, regulated and in a space where they can uh, succeed um, and receive uh, instruction. Uh, the Lakeside Counselor uh, provided 140 sessions across three groups. Uh, groups facilitated, um, groups were facilitated in conjunction with uh, the guidance staff at Penwood Middle School. Uh, the groups were anxiety groups, uh, problem solving um, groups. Oh goodness, and the third one has escaped me. It's gonna come right back to me. Um, he's conducted 46 mediations, uh, and he had a total caseload of 58 students here to date, uh, with 27 active uh, currently for uh, the last two months, last month and a half of the year. Um, one of the things that we know from looking at this data, if you go back to the top where it says individual sessions, 337, um, there is often a cohort of students, uh, and I think uh, Principal Chicano mentioned this um, in his uh, presentation this evening when he talked about uh, the impact of COVID. One of the things that we're seeing, not just, you know, um, in this school district, but across all of the school districts that we serve, and not just here in Pennsylvania, but nationwide is we are really beginning to see the true impact. We're starting to see the true impact of COVID um, in, in terms of our students. And for many students, um, particularly those who, um, I don't wanna say had some deficits, but may, perhaps had some skill deficits or some challenges uh, prior to COVID, um, for many of those youth, um, it, it was um, expanded. Uh, due to the onset of COVID. And so there's often a co cohort of students um, that need the most support. And so we often see that um, in, in some of the schools we serve uh, along with some of the developmental issues. So, you know, developmentally middle school and that transition into high school, there's some developmental 
domains or markers that need to be met. And so you add that or you uh, couple that with um, trauma and some of the challenges, you know, that the tragedy that um, the William Penn community experienced this year. Um, so these numbers are reflective um, of that. Uh, and you'll see that in all of the schools that we serve. Next slide, please. Uh, in the ninth grade academy, um, the Lakeside Counselor provided 286 uh, counseling sessions uh, to 72 students. And again, if you look at um, the caseload in totality uh, with the number of, of students uh, and compared to the size of the school, um, you'll see again, it, it, there's a, a cohort uh, of students who um, need additional support or who can be are high flyers, if you will. Uh, she provided regulation intervention and support to 178 students, which is separate um, in some cases from the students who receive continual individual sessions. Uh, she uh, participated in 29 parent conferences uh, and reinstatement meetings. She facilitated 48 peer mediations um, and she uh, conducted um, four teacher consultations this school year. And from the time period uh, from May 1st uh, to uh, May 31st, she had 10 students, but she was still seeing two, uh, 10 students active on her caseload, although she would see uh, students who would drop in as well. Uh, and last but definitely not least, at the high school, uh, there was a total of 480 uh, sessions provided to students. Uh, the student caseload uh, for this school year uh, was 156 students. Uh, the staff participated um, in 43 uh, it, uh, staff or administrative consultations. Um, there were uh, seven group counseling sessions. So uh, beginning in May, uh, the two uh lakeside counselors uh at, at the high school uh, began to facilitate uh emotional processing groups uh for uh students there uh and we conducted four classroom observations what is not captured in the data uh on the slide you just saw is uh at the middle school the high school and the ninth grade academy um, the staff uh, were available for, to provide healing circles or provide support, drop-in support for uh, students and staff as needed uh, be, from in February and March. Again, just to provide additional support uh, as needed to uh, the students and staff. Um, this concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the report. Are, are drop-ins uh, captured, are they in the individual sessions or are they separate? I'm, I'm sorry, repeat your question, please. The drop-ins, the drop-ins. Are they captured in the individual sessions or are they not captured? So we prepared the, so the total, the actual answer is yes. However, in uh, the ninth grade uh, academy, uh, we submitted these slides uh, up till May 31st. So anybody who dropped in thereafter was not counted in that, but we prepare a monthly report that we send to each of the building principals. So the total data from the start for, of students served from September uh, through June is captured in that report. And that Great. document is sent to each building principal. Great, if I wanted to look at usage like plan sessions versus drop-ins. Could I do that? So that would require, I mean, that was that would be a Dr. B. Coates question because we have a referral list of students. And so that's how we keep that data. Um, right. So we don't synthesize the data. So there's anonymity in, in, in that, in terms of the number, uh, the, the number of duplicated. Now we can provide you with a number of duplicated students versus unduplicated students. Um, so the unduplicated students would, would, would encompass those drop-ins um, or those students that we would see once. We could provide you with that. Yeah, I'm just trying to look at that data to see how we set up our business to serve our students the best, right? If most people are making appointments, that's great. Then we we know that model. If 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 drop in is really 
important to our young people and our staff, then then I, I want to look at that, right? Because that's a different, that's a completely different model. So great point. So what typically happens the way um, the services are implemented in the school, um, for some students, I'll come and see Ms. Janine every Tuesday. All right, all right. Um, but a lot of students come to us by either self-referral or their, their their peers will bring them or a teacher will will bring them. So some and because we have a brief time limited model that um, we utilize where we see students for a period of three to five sessions and that's done to really um, address the level of need in the schools. Right. It's um, in some ways similar to the traditional um, psychological for lack of a better word model that we see like an outside therapy but it's a little right. different because I can see Janine at two o'clock on Miss Janine at two o'clock on Tuesdays but if I need to see her on Wednesday at nine I can drop in so in the model we allow for duplicated students students who are currently on our caseload to drop in as well and so if you're looking at trends in terms of frequency of duplicated versus unduplicated, which is what I think that I'm hearing. I think that's the question. Um, how no, many, how, how wanna... frequently are the unduplicated students coming? Well, I, that's a great question. So yes. Oh, but it I'm, wasn't sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm just looking at who's like, is drop-in use more than appointments? Like I'm looking for that. And my last uh, question um, because we have a lot of slides and I don't want to hog the place up, um, is from a budgetary perspective. I, when will the school board look at this budget for approval and review contract and stuff like this? And how do these numbers compare to last year? Um, I, again, I'm just looking for efficiency. Yeah, so we can do, um, provide information on the comparison. And I believe... The board, as you're well aware, and most of the board members are, we're in budget discussions right now. And so this is an item that's in our current budget. for It's in our current budget, meaning 23-24, and it's also in the budget for 24-25. So, right, but I'm asking about the contract. When will we approve the contract? Once we have a, an approved budget, because we can't okay. approve a contract unless we have a budget. <laughs> And we all know where we are with that, unfortunately. Yes, we do. Thank you. Yep. But the plan is to, I know our thinking is to continue with Lakeside because they have provided some invaluable services. And I think we've heard from principals um, who have talked about the services that they've provided. So that is the plan. I'm Yeah. And I'm not suggesting otherwise. I oh, just, I know. You know, it's our responsibility to look. Yep. All right. So we're going to move on. Thank you, Janine, very much. I appreciate you being here this evening. We're going to move on to special education, and I believe Kate Crossett is going to walk us through these updates. And um, Kate, you can take it from here. Sounds good. Thanks, Dr. Bikos. Um, So I am here actually to share about some really exciting updates um, with special education district-wide um, for the coming year. We as I believe many of you are aware, um, right around this time last year, uh, I was presenting, I think, for the first time with this group. Um, and over the past year, I have done um, many instructional rounds and support visits and data collection and compliance reviews with our school teams. And throughout that time, um, I have learned a great deal about the depth and breadth of the special education services that we have been providing and um, the direction that uh, as a district we are hoping to move together. And as part of that data collection, um, I embarked on um, collecting data through a an internal special education survey of specific um, stakeholders uh, in this realm. And then from there, we also conducted 13 focus groups from April 22nd through May 8th. We had about 40 participants um, district-wide comprised of the following groups that you can see listed there. 
And from that work, um, we were able to draft a special education framework. Um, the premise being, as we're starting to um, share this information with principals, um, that it is meant as a tool to help guide our uh, building leaders and instructional leaders around the services and supports that we, um, like I said, that, that we implement for the entirety of the student continuum in the district. Um, so we created a a sort of submission statement regarding our special education um, department in the district. And so I'll just, you know, read it for the, the sake of the group. At the William Penn School District, we work to ensure all students have access to quality, individualized supports, services, and opportunities to experience meaningful progress in the educational environment. This would be, you know, our, the thing that we are working toward, right, the mission. Does that mean that every single student has um, access to the exact right type and amount of support at this time? It might not, but it is wor what we are working toward and it is how the framework is um, going to work to support our students. And so with that, I wanted to just emphasize a few pieces of that mission statement um, regarding our instructional and service delivery. We wanna make sure that we are supporting all of our students, all meaning all, not just our students who are currently identified, right? We have an obligation as a district um, to what is called child find. And so we must make sure that we are doing um, the processes and our due diligence in collecting the data, doing the assessments and um, determining eligibility for our students. And as we do that, ensuring that any of their needs are being met, um, as recommended by those evaluations and assessments. We also wanna make sure that students have access to those things. So if we don't currently have that support or um, structure in place to meet a student's need, we have to provide it. We have to get that access. Um, when we talk about quality, uh, there are many instructional programs that are implemented district-wide that are meeting students' needs and are of high quality based on research, um, and we want to continue to evaluate the, um, the, the, the bar that of, um, resources that we are providing to our students and the bar of the instruction that's our service delivery that's being provided to our students. Again, we want to make sure that it's individualized because each student has some sort of need that is unique to them, regardless of whether they have a label of special education or not. Um, and then emphasizing, you know, it's not just services. Um, it is services, and it's also opportunities, connecting students with um, opportunities, whether it's a service, an activity, um, a, a different method of delivering instruction. Um, we want to make sure that we are embracing that, and then that we are putting all of those pieces together to ensure meaningful progress and to ensure educational benefit for each of our students. Um, so from that, we also um, developed a curriculum committee who began the work of evaluating additional potential curriculum and intervention options for some identified gaps coming out of the focus groups. We are um, syn finishing synthesizing, uh, as you can see, our final curriculum committee meeting for, you know, this beginning of our work uh, occurred on Monday, and they are submitting their final synthesis around um, what they believe, you know, are potential uh, areas to continue exploring and ruling out um, some additional options um, that we were looking at um, evaluating as well. And um, in order to make sure that our, not just our administrators, but also our teachers on the ground and our case managers 
are being provided that direct level of expectation setting and support, we have built out these um, support, what, what I'm terming support type frameworks within the special education framework. So there's an overall special education framework that has um, specific operating principles for how we are going to engage in our work. But then um, each of the different types of support in across the different BAID grade bands and content areas um, has a support type framework that aligns with it that describes the specific instructional domains, frequency, duration, resources, and general objectives that would be expected to be covered during that portion of instructional time. Um, I do believe that coming out of the focus groups, this was um, one of the largest asks and will be an area that we will see a great deal of fruitfulness from um, because we have really a lot of high quality and capable um, teachers and instructional leaders in the district. And it's a matter of um, providing them with a shared understanding of exactly um, what their specific support type should be focused on providing to our students. Um, the last piece is there were some additional, um, I'm calling them dynamic components coming uh, along with the framework. So the framework is meant to be um, kind of a static structure that will be in place across the course of the coming year and years. Well, of course, we will continue to monitor it and receive feedback and from year to year make adjustments that um, our students don't have time uh, to not have adjustments be made as we as we see them, but there are other dynamic components that have to be updated moment to moment or day by day as we receive guidance from PDE or as we receive additional guidance from our legal counsel or as we continue to refine our protocols and processes and um, build efficiencies. And so with that, um, those include some of our procedural guidelines, um, as well as um, larger umbrella resources and um, a frequently asked questions document in order to direct you know, our teachers um, and leaders to um, have those frequently asked questions answered in a more timely way. Um, in case someone in their building may not know or for our new staff members. Um, so we're excited about sort of the dual duality of both the framework and the, the dynamic um, resource hub that we'll continue to develop. Any questions? I do not see any hands, Kate. Um, let me just stop share just to make sure I'm not missing anything. I do not. And so we're going to go to our last item tonight. Thank um, you. Sure. Thank you very much. We're going to go to our last item tonight, which is another update on where we are with our survey um, action plan. I believe previously we shared information with you about the survey and the um, information we received. And now we're going to share with you information on our action plan. And this is specifically for the district. And so um, Mike is going to take it away for us here. Thank you, Dr. B. Coates. Um, we uh, are in the, the third phase of our, our um, survey uh, administration response and analysis. So we've, we've administered the survey. We had a really great completion rate, as I shared previously. Uh, we performed an analysis and identified areas of strength and areas of concern. And now uh, we've drafted an action plan that has been approved by the cabinet. And so the main purpose of this time is to share that action plan with the board uh, and get your feedback. Uh, the first focus area of our uh, survey action plan is school climate. We seek to decrease the um, the number the the students the number of students that feel that behavior uh, the behavior of other students is getting in the way of their uh, learning, and we seek to increase the number of students that report through the survey 
that uh, the climate of their school is supporting their learning. Um, and as you can imagine, um, this is very aligned with some of the things we were hearing uh, in terms of PBIS from the two schools that presented today uh, for their uh, school improvement plans. And so you'll see our specific goal there. Um, we've been in a three-year uh, trend where uh, there has been uh, students responding about school climate. There's been a decline in the percent uh, favorable. We're looking to um, uh, implement this plan and reverse that trend and see a 5% increase in favorability in terms of the percent of students uh, answering questions about school climate favorably. Our second focus area is uh, focused on our staff. And uh, we are looking to, um, this is actually, um, I mentioned that school climate has had a downward trend. District leadership questions from the staff survey is actually, we've seen a positive trend. So this is something we have focused on in the past, and we've focused on increasing the amount of uh, staff that feel that the district leadership understands their work, values their work, and is supporting them in being more successful. Even though there has been a positive trend, we're not where we want to be. Right now, three out of four uh, staff members answer questions uh, about uh, uh, district leadership um, not in the most positive way. And we're looking for strong, positive responses um, to those questions. So our goal here is to uh, go from 34% answering uh, of staff answering questions uh, positively to 40% of students or of, of staff answering questions positively about district leadership. But let's talk about, um, oh, and um, we always want to be strength-based, right? Because the best way to improve is to double down on the things that are going well. And I shared some areas of strength when I talked to you last, uh, this, this committee last. And one of those is we, across the district, um, one of the highest um, favorability uh, or one of the, the, the questions that get the highest ratings uh, from students are about student relationships with their teachers. So, so students are consistently report, uh, reporting that they feel that they have strong relationships with their teachers. And we want to leverage that in our efforts to improve school climate. Our parents a very high proportion of our parents also report to us that they feel that the barriers uh, between them and engaging with the school are low. They feel like they can engage with their school, they feel comfortable at their school, and they feel comfortable raising concerns. And so we want to leverage that and uh, partner with parents to help improve school climate. And finally, I talked about that positive trend in district leadership. Um, uh, we've already been doing some things. We've been um, getting into schools more. We've been trying to improve our communications with all uh, school staff constituencies, and that has shown uh, positive trends. So we're going to double down on that and um, do what has worked um, in new and innovative ways. And speaking of that, here are the uh, strategies that are aligned with those focus areas. Um, so in addition to, we're talking about the district level uh, survey action plan, but each school is actually creating their own survey action plan, and many of the schools picked school climate as their area of focus. So the first thing we're going to do as the district team is we're going to partner with those schools and make sure that we're supporting them in being successful, supporting things like the PBIS strategies that you heard about uh, earlier. Um, we're also going to look at how we're tracking uh, discipline incidents and try to improve the tracking of incidents and the visibility of that tracking so that schools can see what's happening in their buildings much easier and much more efficiently and then respond. Um, moving on to the staff survey, we're really going to focus on increasing the number of informal uh, touch points that the district team has with schools. And this has a dual benefit. One of the benefits is we get to, we, we it's, it's a direct benefit of um, school staff will feel more understood if they are better understood. And talking to staff is the best way to understand where they're coming from. But it also is going to fuel uh, improvements because we're going to better understand how staff are, are feeling, the challenges they face, and that'll allow us to provide better support uh, as a district team. And then finally, we're also going to do a few things that are just going to help us in both areas of focus. The one I'll highlight is the formative surveys. The, um, the past couple of years, we've only given the survey once in the spring, but next year we're going to give the survey twice. We're going to give a shorter survey um, in November. And what that's going to do is it's going to give us a, um, a uh, leading indicator 
of if the strategies we put into place in the first couple months of schools are moving us in the right direction. Uh, we can move on uh, to the timeline. So this is a general timeline. The plan that was linked um, on the slide previously, uh, the, the couple slides back, also has a very detailed um, timeline. And what I will say is that we have made sure to integrate all those strategies into the things we already do. So we're not adding on a ton of, of, of new things. We're integrating into the, the uh, timeline and, of, and the flow of the school year. All right. So as you can see, it's a lot happening and a lot going on. Are there any questions for uh, Mike at this point in reference to the um, survey and what's been shared? So I have just a short question, um, Mike. In, you stated that in the fall you plan to implement a shorter uh, form of survey. How much shorter? 10%, 20%, 50% shorter? Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so we, we don't um we haven't decided on the exact uh content. Um, but our current survey um covers uh three topic areas. And we we actually uh, use a platform called Panorama uh, to implement the survey. And so they um, in consultation with the survey committee and with Panorama, we're going to um, identify the highest leverage questions that are the most predictive of the outcomes that we care about and uh, you then cut the survey down in that way. Um, so asking fewer questions on our probably just on our focus area topics. So both fewer topics and fewer questions within those topics. And do you have a guess as to how much shorter I know you're 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 focusing on the areas, but you know we have folks who are looking at spending time on this and trying to give them, you know, some extra time on their hands back when they're trying to do when we're asking them to do this twice a year. Um, how much yes. they're going to save in the fall? Yeah, I would say um, at the longest we'd want to cut it by at least a third. Um, and at the shortest, we probably would go just a, a, a third of the time. So anywhere from 30 to 60 percent shorter, I would say, is, is probably going to be our target. Okay. Thank you very much. But I also want to make sure that we don't lose what the focus is. The focus of the survey in the fall is to get a barometer of what we've done to improve. So that's yes. really what the focus is. So it's not to do the full survey that we always do yes. at the end of the year. So that is the focus. I just wanted to make yes. sure that the purpose was clear so that we would know. And then at the end of the year, we will do the full survey. But at least if we find out mid-year, hey, we're worse than we were the year before, we know that we need some more work to do before we get to the end of the, the year. But thank you for that question. Ms. Uh, Henry, I think that concludes all the items that we had for this evening. <laughs> Jennifer's class. Thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll... <laughs> you froze a up lot of Ms. Henry. A lot of content, but um, great um, information. Um, if there are no other for the good of the orders, am I? Am I? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Have a good evening, everyone. Good night.